Today I'm going to explain every single Modern Magic the Gathering combo. Before I do though, two super quick notes. First, in a format as big as Modern, at least in theory, there's potential for an infinite number of combos. Just look at the Against the Odds series, where we're always playing super janky four and five card combos that would never work in competitive play. So obviously, we can't talk about every theoretical combo in this video. That would just be way too much. So how I came to the list of every modern combo for today's video is I went back through the last year of modern decks on the mtggoldfish.com modern metagame page and pulled out any combo that has had any bit of success in paper or on magic online so even though this won't cover every against the odds combo that you theoretically could play at the kitchen table it should cover every single combo that you might actually run into it at fnm or on magic online secondly if you want to try out any of these combos you can snag the combo pieces you need from our sponsor card kingdom over at cardkingdom.com slash goldfish Anyway, here's the explanation of every single Modern Magic the Gathering combo. Yagmoth combo. Yagmoth combo looks to go infinite by taking advantage of Yagmoth Thran Physician's sacrifice ability in conjunction with creatures that have the Undying mechanic, like Young Wolf or Giraffe's Messenger. To go infinite, we need Yagmoth, and then we need two Undying creatures, and maybe one extra piece we'll talk about in a minute. The way the combo works is that you can sacrifice one of the Undying creatures to Yagmoth to draw a card. The Undying creature will go to the graveyard and then come back into play with a plus one plus one counter on it. Now you can sacrifice the other Undying creature to Yagmoth to draw another card and use Yagmoth's ability to put a negative one negative one counter on the first Undying creature, the one that has the plus one plus one counter on it. By the rules of magic, a creature can't have both a negative one negative one counter and a plus one plus one counter on it at the same time, so the two counters essentially just cancel each other out, leaving us with a normal creature with no counters on it. Now the second Undying creature is going to come back into play from the graveyard with a plus one plus one counter, and we can repeat this process an infinite number of times. Essentially, with this setup, we can just keep sacking back and forth one undying creature or the other undying creature using Yagmoth to negate that plus one plus one counter and also draw a ton of cards. If one of our undying creatures is Jorolf's Messenger, our opponent's just going to die to its ETB ability, draining them out of the game. If we don't have Jorolf's Messenger, we need one more piece to close out the game, a Blood Artist, to drain our opponent for one whenever one of our creatures die. Also worth mentioning that some Yagmoth combos play a Hippotra Vizier of Poisons, which essentially can just replace an Undying creature in the combo because of the snake it makes when a negative one negative one counter is put on something. Indomitable Creativity Combo. I was actually on the fence about whether Indomitable Creativity actually qualified as a combo based on our definition, but I figured we should probably add it just because the deck is super popular in Modern. The idea of the combo is to build your deck so it has no artifacts and no creatures except for Archon of cruelty but you'll also play a bunch of cards that make artifact or creature tokens like fable the mirror breaker prismari command or dwarven mine with this setup we know that when we resolve an indomitable creativity it's gonna put x archon of cruelties on the battlefield and getting one, two, three, or four Archon of Cruelties. I guess it isn't technically winning the game, but considering the strength of its ETB trigger and the fact that it's a massive flyer, getting multiple Archons is at the very least a virtual win. Also a quick warning, be aware of Dwarven Mines. Since the land is technically a mountain, fetch lands can find it, which allows the combo to be assembled seemingly out of nowhere on an otherwise empty board. Amulet Titan Combo. Amulet Titan Combo looks to combine Amulet of Vigor's ability to untap lands when they enter the battlefield tapped with extra land drops in bounce lands to get a Primeval Titan on the battlefield extremely early in the game. Once Primeval Titan hits the battlefield, its enters the battlefield trigger can tutor up two more lands. So you grab things like Slayer Stronghold and Sunhome Fortress of the Legion, which will also untap things to Amulet to give Primeval Titan plus two plus zero haste and vigilance and double strike until end of turn, allowing it to hit for six 16 combat damage at a minimum. Plus, you get to tutor out two more lands, which lets Primeval Titan tutor up even more copies of Primeval Titan by snagging Telerio West in a bounce land. Like Simic Growth Chamber, you can use the bounce land to return Telerio West back to your hand, so then you can transmute it to get a Summoner's back to get another Primeval Titan, or in some cases, a Dryad of the Ilsen Grove, which can enable some Valakith the Molten Pinnacle combo kills by turning all your lands into mountains. 
Living End Combo. Living End Combo looks to abuse the graveyard to build an overwhelming board. The idea of the deck is to spend the first few turns of the game cycling creatures to fill the graveyard with big threats. So you're cycling things like Striped Riverwinder, Curator of Mysteries, and Architects of Will. Once your graveyard is nice and full, you cast a Cascade spell like Violent Outburst or Shardless Agent. Because of how the deck is built, the only card you'll be able to cascade into is Living End. So you cascade into Living End and get to cast it without paying its mana cost. When Living End resolves, you'll wrath away all your opponent's creatures and also reanimate all of your creatures. While the game doesn't technically end on the spot, typically this leads to an overwhelmingly big board of creatures, which can win the game in just one or two attacks. Glimpse of Tomorrow Combo Glimpse of Tomorrow Combo is essentially the same as Living End Combo. The idea is to build your deck in a way, so when you cast a Cascade spell like Shardless Agent or Violent Outburst, you know that you're going to cascade into Glimpse of Tomorrow every single time. Glimpse of Tomorrow is a kind of ridiculous card. When it resolves, you shuffle all your permanents into your library and then essentially get that many shots at putting permanents into play from the top of your library. The main difference between Living End and Glimpse of Tomorrow combos is that rather than playing a bunch of cycling creatures to fill your graveyard and reanimate with Living End, Glimpse combo plays the biggest, scariest threats in all of modern, like Emrakul the Eons Torn, Atroxa, and Omniscience, with the hope being that Glimpse will spin into at least one of them and we'll get to play it for free. When things go well, some combination of Emrakul's Omnisciences and Atroxas is going to win the game right away. On the other hand, it's also possible that Glimpse of Tomorrow whiffs and reveals a bunch of lands, which usually causes a combo player to lose the game on the spot. The high risk, high reward, high variance nature of Glimpse combo has led to some players calling it Modern Slot Machine or Modern's Casino, which actually describes the play pattern pretty well. If you run into the deck, outside of directly countering the Glimpse of Tomorrow, your best plan is to try to keep permanence off your opponent's side of the battlefield, because the less permanence your opponent has, the less spins they'll get on the Glimpse of Tomorrow slot machine. Hammer Time Combo Hammer Time Combo is based on cheating Colossus Hammer onto a creature without having to pay its massive equip costs with the help of cards like Sigarda's Aid and Pure Steel Paladin. Since Colossus Hammer gives the creature a massive plus 10 plus 10, it turns any creature into a two shot kill threat. And if it goes on something like an Ink Moth Nexus, a single attack will give an opponent 11 poison counters, killing them on the spot. Underworld Breach Combo Underworld Breach looks to abuse the synergy between Underworld Breach, a zero mana value artifact, and Grinding Station. The idea of the combo is you can sacrifice the free artifact, something like a Mox Amber, to Grinding Station to mill yourself for three cards, then you can exile those three cards to Underworld Breach to recast the Mox Amber from your graveyard, casting this artifact will trigger Grinding Station to untap itself, which lets us repeat this process again and again again and again. So we do this enough times that we mill our entire deck, and once we've milled our entire deck, we can use Underworld Breach to cast a Thassa's Oracle from our graveyard and win the game on the spot. If you do run into Underworld Breach combo, <laughs> Graveyard Hate, probably your easiest way to shut it down. None of these shenanigans actually work if you have a Rest in Peace or Leyline of the Void on the battlefield, but be warned, the decks often play backup plans like Ragavan and so forth, so even if you shut down the graveyard, you're not safe from losing the game. You're just safe from losing to the infinite combo. Twiddlestorm combo. Twiddlestorm combo is actually another Underworld Breach combo deck, but this one plays way differently. The idea is to use Lotus Field, which taps for three mana in Twiddle effects, that cheap cards that untap a permanent or untap land, to generate a bunch of mana. Once we make a bunch of mana, we use Underworld Breach to repeatedly cast Tome Scour, a one mana sorcery that just mills for five, until we mill our entire deck. At this point, we would have milled our entire deck and also cast a ridiculous number of spells, so we can use Underworld Breach to cast Grape Shot from our graveyard and win the game with Storm Damage. Storm Combo Speaking of Storm Combos, Literal Storm Combo is actually kinda similar to Twiddle Combo, but the difference is it doesn't use Underworld Breach or any of those shenanigans. Instead, Storm Combo plays cards like Brawl Chief of Compliance and Goblin Electromancer to reduce the cost of instants and sorceries. With one or more of these cost reducers on the battlefield, 
battlefield, we can dump our hand of rituals and cantrips super, super quickly. And eventually, as we cast our card draw spells and dig through our deck, we'll find a past in flames, which lets us flash back all the instants and sorceries in our graveyard. And once we get to this point where we cast our entire hand and then recast our entire hand from the graveyard, our storm count should be high enough that we can cast a single grape shot and win the game. Outside of the ramp and the finishers, Gifts Ungiven is the key card to the combo. In the hands of a good storm player, a single Gifts Ungiven should be able to find a pile of cards that'll win the game on the spot, in part because one of those cards is usually passed in flames, which is going to work whether it's in your hand or in your graveyard things to flashback. In fact, combo. Infect combo looks to win the game with a single attack from a 1-1 Infect creature like Blighted Agent Glistener Ralph or Ink Moth Nexus by using pump spells to grow its power up to 10. In conjunction with an Exalted Trigger from a Ignoble Hierarch or a Noble Hierarch, any two of Might of Old Crosa, Scale Up, or Vines of the Vast Wood offers enough power for the Infect creature to deal 10 poison counters to an opponent in a single attack to close out the game, and this can happen potentially as early as turn 2. If you have to play against Infect, focus on killing your opponent's creatures while your opponent's mana is tapped, even if that means using instant speed removal suboptimally during your own turn, because Infect combo is typically overloaded with ways to protect their Infect creatures. Devoted Druid Combo Devoted Druid Combo is built around the interaction between Devoted Druid and Vizier of Remedies. With both on the battlefield, we can tap Devoted Druid to add a mana, use its ability to untap it, Itself. But thanks to Vizier Remedies, we won't have to put the negative one negative one counter on Devoted Druid, which means we can activate it an infinite number of times to make infinite green mana. At this point, we can win the game in a bunch of different ways, making an infinitely big walking ballista for infinite damage, casting a huge finale of devastation to make our entire team infinitely big, or drawing all the creatures in our deck with Duskwatch Recruiter. Luxor Giada's Gift can also replace Vizier Remedies in the combo. It works exactly exactly the same way with Devoted Druid. In some builds of the combo, we'll also play Viridian Longbow as a backup finisher. Once you go infinite with Devoted Druid, you can equip the Longbow and just ping your opponent for infinite damage. Hardened Scales Combo While it might seem like a bit of a stretch to consider Hardened Scales a combo since it needs a bunch of permanents on the battlefield to actually win the game in one turn, it does one-shot kill opponents pretty often, which puts it on our list. The main idea is to combo Arcbound Ravager's ability to sacrifice artifacts to add plus one plus one counters to itself with Hardened Scales and also the Ocelus ability to double up the number of counters we're adding. A typical Hardened Scales combo kill involves Arcbound Ravager sacrificing enough artifacts to get up to around 10 counters on itself, which is actually just four or five artifacts thanks to Hardened Scales doubling up the counters. Then we can sacrifice Arcbound Ravager to itself, and thanks to the modular mechanic, put all those counters on another artifact creature, which is often like Ink Moth Nexus, where 10 plus one plus one counters means it's a one-shot kill poisonous attack, or sometimes Walking Ballista. If we also have the Ocelith on the battlefield, when we sack the Ravager, we're also going to get the same number of counters that we put on an artifact creature on the Ozolith, and then we can go to combat and put all those counters on a creature, so it's essentially another way to double up the Ravager's counters, and this is how we can easily grow a Walking Ballista big enough to ping away our opponent's entire life total. Scape Shift Combo Scape Shift Combo looks to generate a lethal amount of damage by wrapping up to seven lands and then casting a Scape Shift to grab a Valk at the Molten Pit Pinnacle in six mountains. This will trigger Valak at the Molten Pinnacle six times to deal 18 damage, which I know isn't technically lethal because in Magic you start at 20 life, but in Modern where most players are playing fetch lands and shock lands, there's a pretty good chance that 18 damage is actually just game over on the spot. If 18 damage isn't enough, you can always wait one more turn to get up to eight lands and then do the same thing but grab two copies of Valak along with six mountains and then you're dealing an absurd amount of of damage. The deck can also combo off with even fewer lands if it has dry into the Ilsen Grove on the battlefield to turn all of its lands, including the Valakids itself, into mountains. Thopter Sword Combo 
Thopter sword combo is built around the interaction between Sword of the Meek and Thopter Foundry. You can use Thopter Foundry to sacrifice Sword of the Meek to make a 1-1 Thopter creature token and gain a life. This will also trigger Sword of the Meek to return itself from the graveyard to the battlefield attached to the 1-1. By itself, this combo is limited by the amount of mana you have access to since each Thopter Foundry activation costs some mana. But if you add Urza Lord High Artificer to the mix, then you go fully infinite since you can tap the Sword of the Meek from mana with Ursa's ability before sacrificing it, giving us infinite mana, infinite 1-1s, one -ones, infinite life, and thanks to Ursa's second ability, uh, the option to cast our entire deck for free. Well, Ursa is what makes the combo so spectacular, don't sleep on just Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek. Making 5 or 6 1-1 one -one flyers each turn by also gaining 5 or 6 life can actually be pretty hard for some decks to beat. Belcher combo. Belcher combo is pretty simple. You need to make seven mana, which allows you to cast and activate Goblin Char Belcher. Since the deck that you'd play Belcher combo in is going to play zero real lands, instead all of its lands are going to be MDFC lands, Goblin Char Belcher's activation will reveal your entire deck and then deal damage equal to the number of cards in your library to your opponent, which is usually somewhere between 40 or 50 damage. I guess in some sense this kind of makes Char Belcher a one card combo, but seven mana is a lot in modern. So the additional combo pieces of the deck are things like Iron Craig Feet to make the necessary amount of mana to play and activate Belcher all in the same turn. Oh yeah, if you ever see a recross the pass from a Belcher deck, be very, very afraid. Since there's no real lands in the deck, recross the pass allows the Belcher combo player to stack their entire deck in whatever order they want. Generally, Belcher players will put Reforged the soul is the top card of their library so you can draw it and miracle it for just two mana and draw seven more cards and those seven cards are going to be a pile of rituals and iron crate feeds and a belcher probably along with some pact negations to be able to fight through any interaction basically if we cross the pass resolves the belcher player is going to win the game the following turn unless you can disrupt them neo brand combo neo brand combo is one of the most convoluted combos to see competitive play in modern the idea is to cast an Allosaurus Rider for free by exiling two green cards from your hand, and then use Neoformer Eldritch Evolution to turn the Allosaurus Rider into a Grizzle Brand. Once the Grizzle Brand hits the battlefield, you start drawing cards with its ability, hopefully drawing into Nourishing Shoals and Autochithion Worms, which you can exile to Nourishing Shoal to gain a ton of life, which allows you to draw your entire deck with Grizzle Brand, which should let you win the game with Thassa's Oracle. Although, the way you actually get Thassa's Oracle on the battlefield is pretty convoluted. Since normally Neobrand is going to be tapped out of mana when they combo off, the way you actually get the Thassa's Oracle on the battlefield to win the game is drawing your entire deck and then casting the rest of your Allosaurus Riders for free and then invoking Endurances to get enough creatures on the battlefield that you can use Court of Calling to tutor Thassa's Oracle out of your library. If you draw Thassa's Oracle, which is going to happen pretty often as you're drawing your entire deck it gets even more convoluted you need to go to your end step and discard the thassa's oracle to hand size and then use an endurance to shuffle it back into your library from your graveyard and then do the court of calling trick like i said the deck looks pretty easy like play grizzle brand draw your deck win the game but it's actually super complicated to play right ad nauseum combo yet another unique combo that ends in the most bland way possible in thassa's Oracle. Ad nauseum combo is actually really two different combos that are kind of related and always show up in the same deck. The first is the namesake ad nauseum combo, which requires you to play a Phyrexia on life or Angel's Grace, which lets you draw your entire deck with ad nauseum without dying to its life loss. Once we draw our entire deck, we just cast a Thassa's Oracle and win the game. An even easier combo in the same deck is Spoils of the Vault combo, which is basically the modern version of the CDH Demonic Consultation Thassa's Oracle combo. Like Ad Nauseam, the combo starts by playing an Angel's Grace or Phyrexian on life. Then you cast a Spoils of the Vault and name a card that isn't in your deck. You were already dead is probably the best choice. This will deal us a ton of damage, but we don't actually lose the game because of Phyrexian on life or Angel's Grace. More importantly, it'll exile our entire library, and then we can just play a Thassa's Oracle and win the game with its ETB trigger. Copycat combo. 
Copycat, or Sahili combo, looks to abuse the synergy between Sahili Rai and Felid Air Guardian. Years ago, Wizards infamously printed this combo into Standard, uh, uh, reportedly without actually realizing the combo was a thing, only to have players figure it out in a matter of minutes and use it to break the format, which eventually led to Felid Air Guardian being banned. While the combo's not as dominant in the more powerful modern format, it works the same way. You play a Felid Air Guardian, then you play a Sahili Rai. You use Sahili Rai negative to ability to make a copy of Felidar Guardian, and then when Felidar Guardian enters the battlefield, you use its ETB trigger to blink the Sahili Rai. Once Sahili Rai comes back into play, according to the rules, it's technically a new version of Sahili Rai, so we can activate its ability again. So we make another copy of Felidar Guardian, which blinks the Sahili Rai, and we keep doing this until we make a few hundred or a few thousand or a few million hasty Felidar Guardians. This swing in and win the game on the spot. Tamishi Combo Tamishi Reality Architect has a unique ability. For white and X, you can bounce a land to your hand and then return an artifact from your graveyard to the battlefield. The idea of the combo is to use this ability in conjunction with Lotus Bloom, which is uh, literally Black Lotus but with Suspend, to make a bunch of mana. We can crack a Lotus Bloom to make three white mana, spend one of that mana and bounce a land to reanimate the Lotus Bloom and then do it again and then do it again and do it again. Once we bounce all of our lands to this combo, we can use all the mana we made to play a Cultivator Colossus to put all of our lands back into play and also draw a bunch of cards, and then we can repeat the process again. Eventually, after we do this for a while, we can win the game by casting a huge finale of Devastation to smash in for lethal, or if we happen to have a Dry to the Ilsen Grove on the battlefield, we can also win with Valica the Molten Pinnacle damage as Cultivator Colossus drops a ton of now mountain lands onto the battlefield. It's it's important to keep in mind that the deck doesn't need to suspend Lotus Bloom to get it on the battlefield and begin the combo. Instead, it can use Wargate to tutor it directly onto the battlefield from the library. So don't feel like you're safe just because your opponent hasn't suspended the artifact. <laughs> you could still very well be about to die. Kiki Combo Kiki Jiki combo is actually super similar to copycat combo. The idea is to combo using Kiki Jiki the Mirror Breaker in a creature that can untap Kiki Jiki with its enters a battlefield trigger, like Restoration Angel, Deceiver Exarch, or Pester Might. So what you do is tap your Kiki Jiki to make a copy of the untapping creature, and then the untapping creature comes into play and untaps Kiki Jiki, and then you repeat this process as many times as you want, making a massive board of hasty threats to swing in and close out the game. Goblins combo. Well, Goblins is thought of as a tribal deck, it's also really a combo deck thanks to Conspicuous Snoop. The idea of the combo is to get a Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker as the top card of your library, often with the help of Bogar Harbinger, which can just tutor a goblin to the top of your deck with a Conspicuous Snoop on the battlefield. Conspicuous Snoop gains all the activated abilities of any goblin that's on the top of our deck, so with a Kiki Jiki on the top, of our deck in a not summoning snick soup on the battlefield, we can use Snoop like it was a Kiki Jiki, but since Conspicuous Snoop is not legendary, we can actually use it to make copies of itself. Unfortunately, all these copies are going to be tapped, but still, we make infinite tap copies of Conspicuous Snoop. Once we have a massive board of tap Snoops, we use our last untapped Conspicuous Snoop to copy the Bogart Harbinger to tutor a Mog Fanatic or a Sling Gang Lieutenant to the top of our deck, and now Snoop is going to gain that creature's ability, so it can sacrifice all the copies of itself for infinite damage. It's worth mentioning here that part of what makes Goblin's combo strong is that the combo usually isn't played in a dedicated combo deck. Instead, it shows up in Goblin tribal decks that can easily win by playing lords like Runvelt Horde Master, card advantage engines like Goblin Ringleader, and so forth. While stopping the combo kill is important, and once Snoop hits the battlefield, that should be your focus, because there's a pretty good chance you're gonna lose the next turn. If you focus too much on stopping the combo, you're gonna end up losing to the goblin beatdowns. Oops All Spells Combo Oops All Spells Combo is kind of like Belcher Combo. It's a combo deck that abuses the MDFC lands by playing zero real lands. Because the deck has zero real lands, a single Undercity Informer or Balistrad Spy can mill our entire deck. So when we play one of these cards, we're going to mill four Creeping Chills, which is 12 damage. And then the rest of the damage to close out the game comes from a somewhat convoluted mill pack 
package of Sword of the Meek's Selvage Titan, Narc Amoeba, and Vengevine. We'll mill over the Narc Amoebas, which are going to trigger the Swords of the Meek to come into play from our graveyard for free. We can then sacrifice the Swords to Selvage Titan to play it from our graveyard for free. The Selvage Titan being cast, combined with the Bellastod Spire Under City Informer that we played earlier, is going to be the second creature we cast of the turn. So that's going to trigger four Vengevines to come back from our graveyard is hasty four threes and if we can get through with two of them we'll hit for the other eight damage and win the game on the spot if we can't win right away we actually get one more turn of attacking thanks to a single nexus of fate which will be milled and then shuffle back into our library so we have one card left in our deck which means we get one more turn to swing with our venge vines and our titans and everything else to hopefully close out the game before we die to our own mill since oops all spells is already playing the all mdfc mana base you'll sometimes also see belcher combo in the same deck as oops all spells mostly as a way to fight against graveyard hate which just hard locks oops all spells combo out of the game so keep that in mind if you end up playing against an oops all spells deck there's a pretty decent chance that especially after sideboarding your opponent might actually switch combos and try to be a belcher combo deck so they can beat your graveyard hate heliod combo Heliod combo looks to combine Heliod Sun Crown with Spike Feeder or Walking Ballista. With Spike Feeder, we can remove a counter from the Spike Feeder to gain two life, and this will trigger Heliod to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature. So we put that counter back on Spike Feeder, and then we can do this again and again and again, which will give us infinite life, which is often a win in and of itself. If we do need to actually kill our opponent, we can go infinite with Walking Ballista. Assuming the Walking Ballista has at least two counters, we can use Heliod to give the Walking Ballista life blank. Then we remove a counter from the Walking Ballista to ping our opponent for a damage, which because it has life blank will now gain us a life, which will trigger Heliod to put the plus one plus one counter back on Walking Ballista. So what we can do this as many times as we want, giving us infinite damage to go along with our infinite life. Jeskai Ascendancy Combo. Jeskai Ascendancy Combo is sort of unique because it's not technically a deterministic win but the way the deck is built if it manages to assemble its combo it's very unlikely to actually fizzle and it should win the game the idea is to combine jeskai ascendancy an enchantment where whenever we cast a non-creature spell we get to untap all of our creatures pump them and also loot with a mana dork or two like birds of paradise sylvan carry added or fate stitcher which works like a mana dork by untapping a land and often comes into play mid combo from our graveyard things to unearth we can use the mana dork to cast a card draw spell like an opt or a consider or a serum visions or a cerulean west which is going to trigger jeskai ascendancy to untap and pump all of our creatures and also let us loot so if we draw too many lands we can loot them away to hopefully find more spells and at this point the idea is that we're just going to keep chaining spells together until we go through essentially our entire deck while also turning all of our mana dorks into like 25 25s or something which should let us win the game at the end of the combo by just swinging in for lethal if our opponent has too many blockers and we can't win with combat we do have a plan as we draw through our entire deck eventually we'll find glittering wish and we can use it to tutor flesh blood from our sideboard and flesh blood can fling one of our massive mana dorks straight at our opponent's face to close out the game with direct damage inverter combo inverter combo is pretty simple you play inverter of truth to exchange your graveyard in your library assuming your graveyard is mostly empty then we can cast a thassa's oracle and win the game with its enters the battlefield trigger selective memory combo selective memory combo is actually exactly the same as inverter combo except it uses selective memory to exile all the cards from the library to win with thassa's oracle rather than inverter of truth nightfall combo nightfall combo isn't nearly as popular as it once was but it still shows up in modern on rare occasions the idea is to combine retreat to coral helm and knight of the reliquary we can use knight of the reliquary's ability to sack a forest or a plains to tutor up another land and then when that land enters a battlefield it'll trigger retreat to coral helm to untap a creature and we can untap the knight of the reliquary so we can keep doing this again and again this will also grow our knight of the reliquary since it gains power and toughness for each 
large land in our graveyard once we tutor out as many lands as possible from our deck and if we have the of my cradle of growth we can literally tutor every land from our deck this way our knight of the relic ray is going to be like a 25 25 or something so with our last knight of the relic query activation we can tutor up sejiri steep a land with a etb ability that gives a creature protection and give knight of the relic ray protection from whatever color our opponent happens to have blockers of and hopefully swing in with knight of the relic query for a lethal attack anyway that is every magic the gathering modern combo explained so if i missed any combos that you're curious about let me know and i'll try to get to you in the comments otherwise which of these combos is your favorite which have you played against which have you played with let me know about that as well thanks for watching everyone i hope you enjoyed it and if you need even more magic make sure to check out the video where i played a single creature and made 500 hasty power or maybe the one where we ranked every single win the game card in the history of magic